What's going on, Spit and Chicklets fans? You know the drill. This interview is brought to you by No Days Wasted, the creators of DHM Detox, the vitamin for people that drink. DHM Detox is a recovery formula with a blend of natural ingredients, vitamins, and electrolytes that help you bounce back after drinking alcohol. Forget the next day nausea, brain fog, and anxiety. It's time to be smart and responsible about when you drink and DHM Detox is your go-to drinking buddy that helps boost your body's natural response to drinking. It's risk-free purchase, so if you don't love it, they'll give you your money back. And as a bonus, here's a sneak peek at their Rapid Immunity Hydration product that is coming soon. Sign up for the email updates at nodayswastedco.com to stay in the loop. They're focused on creating functional, science-backed products that help you be your best. Also, I can't forget, No Days Wasted has also donated $10,000 to the ECHL Player Relief Fund, and they're offering 20% off your order of DHM Detox using the Biz20 promo code. Just head over to their website at nodayswastedco.com for no days wasted after drinking. Now, enjoy the interview. Well... Our next guest is one of the most dominant forwards of the 80s and 90s, so much so that his players credited with giving us the phrase power forward. I don't think we ever heard it before. This guy played. Also, poster on my wall when I was a kid, one of my favorite players growing up. He was the second fastest player to ever score 50 goals in a season after Wayne Gretzky. Played in five All-Star games. He won the Masterton Trophy back in 94. And he capped things off with a Stanley Cup as team president of the Boston Bruins back in 2011. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Cam Neely to the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Hell of an intro right there. <laughs> Damn, all right. Yeah, so I mean, funny. I mean, uh, can't fun butcher this one. You know? No, no, you can't. That's your guy. Uh, funny enough, you know, there's so much to talk to you about your career and what you did as a player. But I just want to um, instead focus on we're going to go over every single move ever made by the Bruins since you took over as president. So we're not gonna <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for this interview? Yeah, or what? Start right from the top. <laughs> And we're actually wow. going to grade them as well, and then we're going to see if it's a fair grade judged, of course, by you. Uh, no, That's seriously. a lot on the plate right there. <laughs> we hope you don't have anything scheduled for this afternoon. The game's in five hours, so yeah. we should be good. But we talk to guys a lot of times, chronological order, and going how you got into the game and your beginning and kind of what, what made you fall in love with hockey. Well, I was born on uh, Vancouver Island. My, uh, six months later, my dad was transferred to a uh, base just outside of, he was uh, in the Air Force and transferred to a base just outside of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. So not much to do in the winter there other than skate. So I was on skates pretty early and just fell in love with the game. And um, and then in 76, he, he retired and moved back to British Columbia just outside of Vancouver. And I continued to play hockey and I started getting invitations into Western Hockey League training camps. I, I, I didn't even really know much about what was going on, but I just said, yeah, I'll go try out. And Then at 17, I went to Portland uh, <clears throat> Winterhawks, made their team. We won the Memorial Cup, and that following September, I got drafted ninth overall. And again, I, during that whole year, I didn't even really know much about the draft and what was going on. But Come on. Swear to God. And uh, it was funny when I got uh, went to Victoria Cougars training camp at 16, and um, I was one of the last cuts. The coach calls me in and says, "What are you going to do?" And I'm like, "Well, I don't know. I guess I'll go back home and play hockey at Maple Ridge." So <clears throat> that December, uh, we played in a, a midget hockey tournament in Portland, Oregon, and their head scout was uh, came to a bunch of games and invited me and this defenseman on our team to practice with the Winterhawks. And I'm like, I don't think I can practice with them. I'm, I think I'm property of Victoria. Like, no, no, they dropped you off the list. You're on no one's list now, so you can come. <laughs> You're like, wait, pardon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they don't get the, they don't get a little check in the mail. Uh, hey, thanks for the prospect. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. Man, I thought I had a chance with that club. <laughs> yeah, we hear a lot of players say that they modeled the game after you when they were growing up. Who did you model your game after when you were playing, if anyone? Um. Well, I liked I, I followed the Leafs a lot when we were in, in Saskatchewan, so it was either Leafs or Canadians, and I, I went with the Leafs. Um, that helped actually when I got to Boston with the rivalry. You already hated them, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I liked uh, I, I I really liked watching Daryl Sittler play, and then when when I uh, we moved back to British Columbia, I started following the Canucks as, as my favorite team, and then um, um, it was really Stan Smeal. Mm -hmm. um, I just like the way he played and how hard he worked. When did the fighting become part of your repertoire? And did you like it? 
Uh, probably about four or five years old. <laughs> <laughs> you could ask my brother. He took my mac and cheese. Yeah, he was dumbing exactly. someone. He loved it. <laughs> I just, you know, I've got a short fuse, so, um, you know, I, when I snap, I just snap. Does that transfer into your everyday life now? Uh, I, I, I would consider myself to have a short fuse, and sometimes I catch myself being like, yo, chill out, <laughs> man. Like, holy shit. Yeah, that's what the kids say to me. <laughs> chill, chill out, Dad. Yeah, relax. Um <laughs> It's 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 it, you know it, it has waned a little bit, but it's still there, unfortunately. But that's uh, part of the reason why it was successful. I so I well, guess that's why you got the sea bass character. <laughs> that was that was actually you just being you. There was not much acting there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now that you brought it up already, what was the genesis of all that? How did that all start? Were you friends with the directors, the Ferrelli brothers? Yeah, so uh, uh, through a mutual friend of mine who, who was really close and still close with Peter Fairley, they went to college together. and um, So I, I, I met the Fairley brothers. Uh, they're huge sports fans yeah. of Boston teams, and they'd come to games and um, – so they just said, listen, we're doing this movie. We we got this character we think he can play. And so when we played out in L.A. that uh, before the movie was shot, they had me come to the apartment and read the lines. and like, oh, yeah, you'll be great. So then all of a sudden, Jim Carrey gets on board. And this is right after Ace Ventura came out. So I'm like, I call him up. I go, listen, guys, you sure you want me in this thing? It's getting to be a bigger movie. Like, no, no, you'll be fine. There's one really good story out of that shooting that. So the bathroom scene at the at the gas station where I kicked the bathroom door open. So you have the, the stall walls and the door, and then where the back wall and the toilet would be is the camera set up and, and, and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the director and the guy, you know, filming. And then Jim Carrey was sitting on a milk crate in, in the corner. So I kicked the door open, and I'm supposed to have this surprised look on my face and, like, cut. Cam, can you get a little bit more, you know, of a sh shocked look on your face? I'm like, yeah, okay. Second take, third take, fourth take. Now I'm freaking out. Oh, now your real temper's coming up. Well, I'm like, <laughs> I got Jim Carrey sitting on a milk crate, and, you know, he's making $10 million or whatever the hell he's just <laughs> for that movie, and I'm like, you know, wasting everybody's time. So I pulled Jim aside. I go, listen, Jim. I said, please just bear with me. I'm, I'm really struggling here. He goes, ah, Cam, don't worry about it. I've had some scenes that have taken 50 takes. Just relax. <laughs> Next take, I kicked the door open. He's mooning me. So I got the sh they got the shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's unreal. Was he, so he was a, obviously an awesome guy to work with. Yeah, he was very cool. And Jeff Daniels, too, really cool guy. He's actually a huge Red Wing fan, so he was very cool. You were also Monument Ave, too. Uh, Den your buddy Dennis Leary's movie yeah. as well. You played. You were the stunned yuppie who had a, 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 what, someone broke into the house, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, just you know, asked... Uh, if I wanted to be in it, I thought it'd be fun. So, anytime I've tried to uh, try to go get an acting spot, I never I never worked out. But so everything <laughs> everything I'm, I was in, I was asked. So, so were you passionate about it? Were you not really? I, I you know I was you know as we all are right after we're done playing, we're trying to figure out what the hell we're doing. Yeah. So I'm like, well, let me let me try this. I've been in a few things, but it's just it's not my cup of tea. I'm not an actor. Yeah, uh, I, I this guy's a professional. I, I, I can't do it either. But oh yeah yeah. No, you, you, know, you guys, your doing. commercial was great. <laughs> yeah, he wrote the whole thing. No, I didn't. Yes, he did. He pretty maybe much we'll did. Maybe we'll get you he in the next veteran. one, Cam. Right. Just, you know, come up and maybe he just comes and smash both of yeah, us. Yeah, just, just don't have me audition for it because I won't make it. <laughs> no, no, we'll invite, exactly. We'll have to invite you. So I, I want to just go back because you come on the scene, you say you don't know much what's going on. You light up Portland. Next year you're in the NHL and you're in Vancouver for three years. Biz actually was was surprised in that not a ton of people know that you were even in Vancouver first. I mean, so many I think fans out there just think he was a Boston Bruin. So what was the experience like when you got there and, and kind of did you know right away maybe this this isn't the place for me? Well, you know what it's like when you just get in, right? You're happy to be there and like, okay, yeah. how do I stay here? And and um, you know, at the time, Vancouver was always struggling. You know, they actually went to the finals the year before I got there. Uh, and lost to the Islanders, um, and they had Tony Tanti and Stan Smeal on the right side. So I was automatically either going to be a third or fourth line right winger when I first got there. Um, and then my third year, I actually played. I think you know I, I played less games, but I think I probably played more minutes in my rookie year than my third year. The the coach uh, wasn't really fond of me in my third year. So I remember one game I suited up as fourth line center. 
I'm like, okay, things aren't going well here. <laughs> like, Whoa, this, this could be ending. Soon. Yeah. So, um, and then I got the, a surprise phone call. Actually, my sister, uh, on my birthday in June, I was working out with some buddies. And, and this is, you know, obviously before cell phones and whatnot. And so the, uh, my sister gets a hold of me at the club I was working out at. And she says, uh, you, the GM is looking for you you've been traded so my sister's the one that told me i was traded <laughs> so i call the gm and he goes uh yeah you, you, we traded you to boston so now i'm like oh my god i barely could play for the canucks how am i going to play for the bruins um but it just worked out wow so it wasn't an example of like i just got to get somewhere else i'm going to light it up it was more you even worried maybe i can't make it in this league well I, yeah because I, I was like I, you know i was playing limited minutes in vancouver and and my confidence was shot yep and I'm going to Boston, which is a it was a better team, had better players, uh, better record. And I'm like, how the hell am I going to play here? Do you believe that you'd been given a fair shake at all in Vancouver, or even in the early going when you were, you just you just hadn't developed to what you eventually became? Yeah, I think it's a it was a, probably it's probably a little bit of a lesson in in um, you know understanding players' development curves. Um, you know, with the position I'm in now, it's like. You know, you could say, well, you know, I would say they would say, well, you're a young player, young player. I'm like, well, but it's my third year in the league. You know, I don't don't just say I'm a young player. Like, you know, the the whole development process probably wasn't as good at back then as it should be for younger players to say, okay, here's what we need you to work on. Come on yeah. out here, and, and we're going to work on the details, not just you know now now. There's so much more communication. There's all the video and and things that you can help try to develop these players but back then it was like you make a mistake it's like you're Sit on down. Yeah. yeah yeah that's crazy yeah. do you think me i haven't checked the numbers you think that's maybe why like you look back on some moves and trades and you're like what they gave them up for nothing it's just because people just maybe, gave up maybe they just gave up way too easy more so than nowadays because you have so many scouts and there's so much technology around it but probably a little bit of that and, and the fact that um you know depending on on the organization and where the team's at you know, maybe someone's saying, hey, we need someone that's got a little bit more um, experience. We don't have the time to develop. We can get something for this player. And then all of a sudden the player starts developing and takes off. So when when you became a Boston Bruin and that trade went down, maybe your offensive numbers weren't what you hoped they were, but Bruins fans must have seen your style of play and just loved you immediately. Yeah, I, I was, uh, you know, right away, especially the old barn, uh, oh. uh, garden, right? I mean, uh, perfect uh, size for me. So um, <laughs> you're just hitting that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, so I think just the the, the the way I played and the physicality part of it, um, you know, the fans embraced me. And then, you know, I, I ended up starting to score, which I did as, you know, growing up my whole life, I was I, I was able to score. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the fact that that building was kind of suited me and, and yeah. my style certainly helped. Because they took a ninth overall, it must have felt like the Canucks were quitting on you. Did that light a fire under your ass when you got to Boston a little bit? Um, well, it's just the fact that you're like, okay, where's my career going? Uh, yeah. You know, and, and I got a, I got an opportunity right away when I first got here. They put me with the better players, and, and they were like, okay, let's see what this kid can do. Um, Who was that that year you played with mostly? Uh, I played with uh, uh, Rick Middleton a lot that year. Um, uh, Charlie Simmer a bit, too. He was on his way out, but uh, 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 a bit with Charlie Simmer as well. So uh, they gave me some opportunity of power play and things like that. I look at your first year on that on, uh, as a Bruin. Ray Bork led the team in scoring 95 points. But as I look up and down the lineup, like you played Mike, Mike Milbury that season. What, yeah. <laughs> you must have some funny stories about that guy. Well, he also coached me, and, and I and I think he, oh, to yeah. be honest with you, he was probably the best coach I had. Um, I thought he really had a really good pulse of of the team and the players and the personalities. Um, but I remember one time at training at training camp, I, I didn't know anybody, so I didn't really I didn't really uh, have the oh I can't do this or shouldn't do this. I just ran him over. <laughs> One time in training camp, <laughs> like, hey, the train's coming. <laughs> <laughs> who were who were like the older guys to take you under their wing, or were you kind of just you know you did your own thing? And well, uh, you know the, the the one thing about the original six franchise is you know there's so much history there and so many great players that played and and uh, you guys were talking about earlier before we started about Derek Sanders. He was doing color at the time I got here. Um, you'd see Bobby Orr come in and out. John Busick worked for the team. He still works for the team. 
And then, you know, from a player's perspective, obviously Ray Bork, you know, these guys would help make you feel comfortable. Um, you know, Reggie Lemelin, older goalie, been around a while, um, had a lot of experience. So, uh, again, I mentioned Rick Middleton. Uh, he was great. Gordy Kluzak, he, he was a little older than me, but, you know, he, he'd been in Boston since he's been 18. Jeff Cortnall. Uh, he was, I didn't know him. I played against him, but didn't know him. And he was a guy that picked me up at the airport when I got here. Did I send it at one point? Is it true? He told you to stop fighting. Like, and if so, did it piss you off that you couldn't? No, I, um, Milbury actually told me that I, I, you know, for me to pick my spots, not have guys decide when I'm going to fight. Right. Which was difficult because you, you, you know, it's hard to turn down. They're questioning your manhood. You know what I mean? So That's what they're doing. But it was it was more they wanted me on the ice more not in the box so I, I got it from that perspective but um, and and the other thing was like a, you know where I I felt like if when I f did my best fighting was when I was when I was the one that started I was pissed off I could never really fight very well I don't know how you do it when you're not upset I mean that that's that that didn't work well for me no. <laughs> yeah the, the wires had to cross yeah. who, who was the one guy who could get on your skin the most and you're like every game you're like this fucker's coming well there's, after there's me. well no not well two guys and they and they didn't really want to fight was, he pulls uh, out a piece of paper and the samuelson and and uh, and claude lemieux all samuelson and claude lemieux i mean it's it's you know, there's enough there's enough uh, uh stories out there about the battles uh i've had with those two guys yeah were you familiar with the Boston uh, Montreal like heated rivalry when you got here? Yeah, very much so. And I mean, um, you had a huge part in undoing it too. Well, I love playing them. I really did, and I love I love playing in Montreal, especially winning up in Montreal. And you had Patrick Waugh's number. Let's call a spade a spade. Yeah, for some reason, I just uh, was able to uh, get some by him when when it counted. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we were talking with um, Sanderson earlier, and and back then there was no communication whatsoever between opposing players. Right. Like if they were in the same venue, and they didn't know, they would walk out. He told the story. What were your relationships with other guys around the league? Like, would you and Raw joke about that off the ice? No, I, I didn't really like to get to know too many players because I felt like if I did, I might let up. Like, if I'm going in the corner and I, there's a defenseman that I like, I'm like, ah, I might not hit him as hard as I normally yep. would. So, for me, it was best to, to, you know, obviously I've had teammates that got moved and traded and, and, and myself when I went back to Vancouver. Um but I didn't really get to know a lot of guys from other teams. So R.A. talked about if, if you were asked to kind of curb the fighting. And the one year, you, all right, so you had 74 games, 190 PIMS, 37 goals. What a season. Jesus. <laughs> but then the next year, the PIMS dropped down. It was 117, and that's the first year you got 50. You got 55. So you think it actually probably really did lead to you becoming an even higher level goal scorer? I think so. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if you're sitting in the box for yeah. five, eight minutes 10 minutes um you know it's gonna it's you're gonna get less opportunities to score so i think it did help but you know the, the, i still had to remain physical it's just to it's just try to get you know take the the fights down a little bit is what they were suggesting so you, like are you a guy that i mean you, you have a temper right you're a snapper are you breaking sticks out there when you're mad like were you somebody just when you, when you're going nuts on the bench guys just give them give them a couple feet yeah i think so i mean uh <laughs> oh shit here goes cam again yeah. No, I've had a few meltdowns on the bench in the locker room uh, when things aren't going well. Um, I still have meltdowns. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was it you who tossed the water bottle? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. geez, okay. great though. Snap show. <laughs> See, I think people love it. <laughs> uh, people associate uh, your your fifty goal seasons with Adam Oates, but he was actually only there for one of your fifty goal seasons. Who were who were the main guys? Well, Craig, uh, Craig Janning was uh, the centerman that I got the other two with, um, and. You know, when when Craig got traded, you know, obviously I knew Adam. Uh, I didn't know him well. I knew him, you know, um, from as a player, and and feeding Brett Hall. So I'm like, okay. But when you know, when I started playing with Adam, I'm like, by far the best backhanded passer I think the game's ever seen, in my opinion. It was just like even if he had on his backhand, he's it's getting to you. And it's hard. <laughs> it's not just a little you know muffin. He coming talks your about way. that. We interviewed him. He talked about that a lot actually about just making sure he's good on your backhand. Like, and that guy just did it. Well, you think about you think about 
a right hand and center and having two right wingers, myself and Brett Hall, I mean, you got to, you better be good on your back. <laughs> <Yeah. end. laughs> You're going to catch heat from one of them. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, I mean, you don't limit yourself to like, I, I mean, there's like a stat now at how many times you're forced out the strong side, how many times you're able to make plays. But I mean, a guy like Sid, like push, force him out any way and he's going to be able to make right. that, that low percentage play a higher percentage uh, at the time. Yeah. Was the chemistry instantaneous with you two? Or is it something you had to work with, work on them? I'm no, guessing it, not with, with OT. No, it was it was instantaneous. I mean, we didn't really uh, we didn't really have to talk a lot on the ice either. I I just told him I said, "Listen, Adam, I don't like the puck in the neutral zone. <laughs> <laughs> when wanna, I'm in the slot, yeah, you find me exactly. I want it in the offensive zone. You can deal with the puck in the neutral zone. <laughs> so, as a centerman, is he like, oh, God, I got to do all the lugging, or is he no? Just I, think like, oh, he, I think he, I think he, he probably had to do a little more. And Brett would be, if Brett was honest, he would say he had to do a lot more with Brett than he did with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, go ahead. When they told you about the trip, were you like, "Ah, oh, shit, there goes my sentiment. And then it's like, well, we're bringing an Adam Oates. You must have been. Yeah, I was hurt. I was that. hurt at the time uh, when that trade went down. So, you know, I was just like, wow, okay, that'll be a big change when I get back. And But, it, it uh, you know, he's a, obviously a yeah. hell of a player. When when you're playing in, in your heyday, what was your summer routine? Are you working out a lot at that point, or is it? Yeah, um, it's it, – so when I – I got, you know, I got the thigh injury back in 92. Um, and that's when I really started, like, you know, my off season became about rehab and, and, yep. and um, you know, and, and exercise. And uh, Mike Boyle, yep. you know, Mike, uh, you know, he was working with the Bruins and, and, you know, I'm working out with him and he's having me do all these crazy freaking exercises. I'm like, where's the bench press? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what are we doing? I, I go, I'm a 50 goal scorer. What are we doing here? He's like, well, don't you want to get 70? I'm like, okay, yeah, I do. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it, Mike. Yeah. Uh, when you guys finally beat the Canadians, I think it had been like 44, 45 years, you know, the so-called jinx here. Was that the, the biggest win you had as a pro up, up until that point? Yeah, I mean, what it meant for the organization, what it meant for the city. Yeah. I, you know, I knew it was going to be big, but I didn't recognize or realize it was going to be that big. I mean... We flew in from Montreal, and I think there was like two thousand fans at the at the airport. Matt, I'm willingly, R.A. Yeah. was there at the front. <laughs> yeah, she has a signed napkin. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it, it was it was it, you know it was it was big for uh, for Boston. It yeah. really was. I was telling these guys they're a little younger than me. I mean, you were all over the gossip pages back then. They had the inside track. I mean, oh, you and LB God. were run, <laughs> running all over this town. He's like, thank yeah. God they didn't have cell phones and cameras. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> I I, I I I I feel bad for the current athletes today because you cannot hide. Well, no, you no but no on chance. the other hand, like you must see some of the money that these kids are signing for, and you're like, I put in that many years, and these guys are signing this much money out of entry levels. Yeah, it. it uh, but how I can sleep at night is I I go well, I made more money than the guys before me. That's true. So yeah, that's, that's you know it, it that's is the way what it, it goes. Is. Right, it's the way it goes. I just. The only thing that frustrates me is, is, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, you know, we're hoping you're going to do it. Here you go. Right. And that would frustrate me too if I had to sign checks. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where the character is a big piece is what's the character of these players, right? How frustrating would it get for you at times? I mean, we just had Derek Sanders on. He talked about how brilliant of a hockey mind Harry Sinden was. But there were obviously issues here in Boston about spending money. How how pissed off would the players get in the room that basically the, the team wasn't spending what they should have been probably? Uh, it was frustrating. There's no question because you want to win. You, you, you know, for for a good four-year stretch there, we either went lost in the finals and lo- or lost in the conference finals. And, you know, we knew we were a little depth away from really being able to compete um, against the top teams, Pittsburgh and, and, and Edmonton. Um, so you don't really understand what's going on upstairs, right? You just Now like, you do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Do, you understand, do you understand now more, a little more like, okay, that's why Harry did it? Or is it well, so? it's just, you know, it's just philosophies, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, you know, and I, I think uh, – you know, as a player, you know, you want every chance, right, to win. That's why we're playing. I mean, you, you think about winning the Stanley Cup, lifting the Stanley Cup as a player. Um, so you want to, you know, if, if you have ownership that's willing to spend to the cap, but now I think it's, you know, I think because there's a cap, it's probably a little bit different now. It's like, oh, they're not spending to the cap. 
you know, the fans can recognize that now. Right. Yeah, right. it wasn't as apparent. I think right. people knew, but they, there was no facts right. about it. Right. Um, so, the, I mean, those teams, those Boston teams are so good. You mentioned the two finals appearance, two just incredible Oilers teams. I mean, did you, what do you remember about those series? Was it, was it a lot closer than it seemed, you think? 88, we, you know, we weren't anywhere near as, as good enough to beat Edmonton. I thought 90, we had a chance. We had that triple overtime game. And Klima. They, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Fucking Klima. Wes and Wesley, uh, you know, unfortunately missed yep. a, an open net. Um, and that, <clears throat> I think that took a lot out of us, that game. Um, and then it was just over after that. But I thought we had a better chance in 90 than we did in 88 for sure. You mentioned Glenn Wesley. He was uh, part of the deal that uh, eventually brought you to Boston from Vancouver. Are you surprised that deal is still paying dividends for the organization all this time later? It, it's amazing to me. Someone's done this tree, right? Yeah. This yeah. hockey tree. It, yeah. it, it blows me away that uh, you know it's still there's still some fruits from that deal. Yeah, on the <laughs> team right now, Sean Corral. Yeah. 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 All these, only 30 years later. That's pretty wild. That though, is insane. Trade is still bare fruit. Where did you find that one, Ari? On the f- no, that one I've seen actually yeah. a lot before. It's how crazy it, it just it's, it's so never you, so, ending. So obviously you've seen this. How did you see that? You on social media? What's that? <laughs> yeah, Cam, that, that, Cam has a yeah, burner. I'm, 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 what do they call I'm a lurker. Burner accounts. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a lurker. <laughs> no, I, 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 <laughs> He's checking you know, it out. I, He's I, seeing I follow it. Certain, I follow a lot of people, but no one knows me following them. So now you're on the... But I don't the, tweet. I don't uh, do any of that stuff. But. You're on the other side of it now. Like, what do you make of... Like, I love Brad Marchand. Yeah. And I'm a Coyotes fan, and I'm like, every team... And yeah, he crosses the line maybe a tad sometimes. <laughs> what, what do you do? You guys kind of giggle sometimes at how ridiculous it is. Uh, well, you have to. <laughs> I mean, you know, you love. You have a sense of humor. Y- yeah, you, you love him on the ice. I mean, there's a couple, you know, like the licking. I'm like Brad, really, with the licking. <laughs> Text from from Cam. Yeah, it's like okay, you know. Um, you know, but I got to tell you, if he's not on your team, you, there's no question you hate him. But if he's on your team, his his teammates love him. You know he he's a he's turned himself into a hell of a player, um, and he's and he's you know he he just doesn't give a can I can I say shit he just doesn't Please. give a oh, shit yeah. he doesn't give a oh, shit oh you can say yeah. a lot of things on your <laughs> <laughs> well we we talked about um, just you know as you became a Bruin the domination that you had as a player in the team and then everyone knows it was a, a dirty vicious hit that 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 took out your leg by Elf Samuelson what do you what do you remember about that moment I'm sure it sucks to think about but immediately what happened after and the treatment how how that all went down well obviously a lot has changed right from uh from when I was playing as far as uh, uh, uh treatments and 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 recovery and rest yeah um but it just started a, a snowball effect when you know because I I uh, had to be put in a so it was such a hard hit that part of my quad um solidified so uh it started turning to bone so they had to treat it like a broken bone so I was in a straight leg brace for 2 months Jesus but the problem was I wasn't on crutches I was just walking normally with a limp on a, so I think walking like that for 2 months without being able to bend my knee it it created a problem in my in my knee uh when I came back in um early January so I this happened in May in the playoffs and I I didn't come back until early January uh, we played in Toronto one night, and we're coming back home to play Montreal uh, the next night. I woke up from tr- the game in Toronto. My knee was blown up. No pain. Uh, I don't know what I did. There was no pain associated, but it was just full of fluid. Nothing in the game had happened. <clears throat> no. So um, pl- I saw the docs. are like, well, you know, does, does it bother you? I said, no, I have no pain or anything. Well, well, well why don't you pl- we can play tonight, and then, you know, we'll take a look. We'll add it tomorrow. So the, the swelling wasn't going down. Finally, I said, well, let's do a scope. They did an MRI. M- I don't even know if we did an MRI then. Uh, po- probably did an MRI then, but they said, well, let's do it, have a scope and take a look and see what's going on in there. <clears throat> so I'm thinking at worst, I'm 10 days out. So I'm coming to, and the doc's looking over, and he goes, um, your season's over, and I'm concerned about your career. I'm right like, as you what? woke up? Yeah. No bedside manner there. <laughs> Jesus, like, buddy. Just, Are you kidding let's me? Let's just get the information while he's groggy so I can get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I made some decisions while Cam Neely was asleep. <laughs> Holy shit. So there was a big, uh, like a size of a dime piece of uh, joint surface cartilage on the end of my femur in my knee that was torn. 
So they had to drill a bunch of little holes in my femur to create some blood that would that would uh, uh, hopefully create this uh, fibril cartilage. So uh, I, then I had to be in this in this uh, continuous passive motion machine yeah. for three weeks for twenty three hours a day. Oh my god! It was yeah, yeah. It that's was, torture. It was unbelievable. But I'm like, I'll do whatever you guys say I have to do to try and get back to play. So. And then, of course, you, you famously scored 50 Thank goals on, I mean, what everyone said, one leg, basically, in 44 games. I hate how they say it's 49 games. Yeah. You did it in 44. <laughs> Drives me crazy. But yeah. I, how did you get that done, man? I mean, you, you were basically on one leg, and you scored 50 fucking goals. Well, <laughs> having a, a hell of a sentiment help. Yeah, but, no you know, doubt. I still had to get down the ice somehow. Um, but what, 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 what I was doing was I, was I wasn't playing back-to-backs um, because my knee was still, you know, acting up. And I was I stopped morning skates, which at first I was like, God, you know, because you're like that's a routine. You feel like you need it. Yeah, you know, you're in the routine. Oh, if I don't have a morning skate, I don't know if I, you know, how is it going to affect my game? I'm a, I'm telling you something. It changed how I felt at night. Like you know, you know, it's like you get up, put the equipment on, take it off. Yeah, you know, it's like a waste of time. Now teams are gassing it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, it's to me waste of energy. It really is. I mean, unless you want to work on some things. Yeah. But it, you know, I think it was instituted, as we all know, for the back the guys back in the seventies to stay 60s. out of the bars or sweat it out. Yeah, exactly. You know, because it's they, so true. So now guys are sweating out uh, <clears throat> almond milk, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> soy <laughs> milk latte. <laughs> but that season, I mean, were you doing were you doing a ton just to get ready to play every night? Was yeah, it one it was, of the? Yeah, that's a lot just, of work. It was, so mentally, it's exhausting. Yeah, I just, I mean, I lived in the training room, which yeah. sucked, and um. You know, just a, just a lot to try and you know get out there and play the games. But you know, I mean, you'll as a player, you'll do whatever it has to have to do to get out there, right? And 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 two years later, you know, your career's it, it was completely cut short. But even that last year, you're a point per game player over 25 goals. It was just more the mental aspect of it. I just can't do this anymore. Well, what happened was, and I think uh, you know, no no one can really say for sure, but I really feel like. So my right hip started bothering me. Well, actually, I thought it was my groin because I had pain in my groin and, and uh, you know, it just wouldn't go away and it was constant and, you know, working on my groin constantly. And they finally said, well, let's get an x-ray and, and, you know, my hip was a mush. So I think it was because it was my right hip and all the injuries were on my left leg, I think overcompensating for those years. Yeah. You know, plus hockey players, we you know, we you know, the way we skate, so weird yeah it doesn't it doesn't uh bode well for the hip joint so it was just the pain I, I i just couldn't deal with the pain anymore in the hip and it was all day couldn't sleep it was just it was horrible that's no way anyone should live that's why i think sometimes people don't even realize as athletes like it, it can seem like it's going great when you're scoring 50 but every single day is a grind to get through it's, right. it's hard to imagine to continue to do that um the animosity i mean i know uh samuelson's in the in the press box sometimes now like do you ever bump into him like have you guys ever had a conversation i actually remember he was with the coyotes right and and, and of course, uh, this is the year they ended up winning it. Cam was with the Bruins, and we we played in that game in Prague. Oh right, yeah. And we ended up going to that castle yeah, a couple yeah. nights before yeah. the game, and him and him and Samus are in the same room. And I'm thinking, okay, like, we might have a fucking Donny Brook in here. Sea <laughs> bass is in the room. Yeah, I, I, I we have we haven't really. Uh, he, I've never really bumped into him to have a conversation. Yeah, so, you don't need was, to. No. Was you don't it, need to. Was it tough? Uh, I mean, I'm assuming. Was it tough to not be bitter when your career ended, the, when it did the way it did, or are you still maybe a little bit bitter, perhaps? Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not bitter. It was really difficult. Right. It oh, was, I remember your retirement. Yeah, the, the first three years were very hard because I still felt I could play at a high level. Oh, um, that's... You know, w w not many athletes can retire when on their terms. So, you know, we all know that going in, we we're either told we're not good enough or an injury happens. Um, it was just, it, it was frustrating because I lost a lot of good hockey. Yeah, a lot of great hockey. I mean, right after the you say for three years it is hard, and I think every player goes through it. But now you you're in a position where I think it was 2007 you started you worked back with the Bruins, and and as like being on the other side of it, as Biz mentioned, does it make you appreciate more what what kind of players go through every day? Well, it's or, the, or what your side goes through every day. Excuse me. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, it's just it, it's really kind of a great learning experience of of, of you know the the business side of hockey, yeah. right? Because we focus on just being a hockey player when when you're playing, and you don't really understand, you don't really care to understand what what's going on um, and how things are run and why are decisions being made that way, and and nor should the athletes. We just just you know the players should just focus on how they're going to play well every night. But it was just it was really uh, interesting learning experience. Ken, what do you make of the the decrease in fighting and basically the lack of players policing themselves like they did when you when you played? From my, I, I hated it when they put the instigator rule in. Yeah, I joined the club. Um, you know, I thought that that really, you know, that was the the first step in the direction of really reducing fights. I was never a big fan of the stage fighting and and uh, okay, nothing's going on. My tough guy is going to fight your tough guy. I didn't really understand that. I could see. If there was something in the course of a game that pissed somebody off, and they're like, "Okay, you got to answer the bell for that," that's you know part of hockey, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I certainly understand. You know, with with the concussions and everything that we know about concussions now, um, but I I still oh well, the other thing I hate is after a good hockey hit, you got to answer Fight the bell. Now. Yeah. I just don't get it. Yeah. yeah. So you know. The fighting, okay, but I, 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 I still love aggressive hockey. And, you know, I still like to see guys getting blown up um, and with a good hit. I mean, now with some of the rule changes where players are like, okay, I'm going to turn my back so, you know, he won't hit me. But sometimes it's just too quick. You can't stop. Uh, where before guys would, you know, they would, they would brace themselves for a hit. Well, you, I mean, you say your wires can snap, and we kind of have all seen that post-playing career in some videos in the in the press box. <laughs> how hard is how hard has it been to just not have any control over the game? You know, you're almost no, more nervous in those roles than you were playing. No question. Um, you know, when you're a player, you think, okay, my next shift, maybe I can make a difference, or next period, or next game. You know, a lot of a lot of times for us, all the decisions are made, and we're just hoping it works out. Right. Anxiety and, filled. And yeah. You're just like, you know, let's just get through this healthy. Let's get a win. Let's get out of here. <laughs> so what do you remember when you're down 2-0 in the finals to Vancouver flying home? Were you were you were you thinking, all right, we're fine? Or were you like, Jesus Christ? Well, I, I felt I felt like, uh, uh, you know, we were in both those games. So, I, I you know, I wasn't I wasn't uh, overly concerned, you know, kind of, you know, you're always like, for me, it's like, let's win these, the odd number games. So one, three, five, seven, obviously, right? So I'm like, you know, you got to win game three and then you back in it. Um, so, and, and our home record in that finals was, it was, was crazy. The way, you know, just what the goals the guys were scoring. And, um, but I, just because we were in, in those first two games, I, I felt pretty confident we could get climb back into the series. Yeah. I actually want to go back to the the uh, acting stuff. I was watching TV with my wife a few months ago in an old nine hundred two one zero episode. Come on, <laughs> this guy and who comes on the screen? Come and, on, <laughs> this guy was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I thought you only had two roles. No, yeah, he's yeah, like yeah, that's movies. Roles. We haven't uh, gone to TV yeah. yet. <laughs> uh, and I think I, I think it was just after Nike might have bought Bauer because everybody in the head, like all the players, oh, yeah. Nike yeah, front yeah. and center on yeah. the on the on the TV. But how did that come about? Like. I, I forget how that came about. Uh, I, I, I know they were doing some kind of a hockey scene. and yeah. um, Jason Priestley was a... Wow. Yeah, and, and I did uh, the... Uh, I was in the Mighty Ducks uh, movie. So I, the director was also... He directed some Family Ties episodes, so maybe that was... A, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> He's just connected. Hey, you still, <laughs> still pals with Michael J. Fox? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, How's we, he doing? He's he's amazing. I mean, it, it's it's hard, um, but his his attitude uh, about life and his lot in life is is pretty special. He's yeah. done so much to raise like awareness and money. Oh, it's unbelievable. Park. It's, it's wild to yeah. see that he's still out there. It's crazy. I think he got one of maybe the loudest applause ever at the at the garden when the, they were doing one of the charity games. I think oh, yeah. right when yeah. the building first opened, I, that might have been the loudest I ever heard that building. He skated out yeah. the ice for the, for the game. Yeah, he loves he loves hockey. Um, he he's always watching. Uh, do you feel the pressure here just because of you know original six team and, and I mean now that you guys are very very competitive, does it ever get to be too much? It's not too much. I mean you know you know we have everybody has expectations, right? We have our own internal expectations. Uh, obviously, 
our fans have expectations. Um, I think what's happened with the success of the other teams in the city certainly, you know, starts driving everybody to, okay, well, you know, we've got to be good. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a great market to play in. It's not, it's not as intense as maybe some of the Canadian cities, but it's for an American city. It's a great, it's a great market to play in. Um, the fan base is smart. They know, they know what they're watching. They've, they either came with their grandfathers or fathers or mothers and grew up with the, the sport, played the sport. Um, but it's, it's, you know, there's, there's, uh, everybody wants to win, right? So, which is not a bad thing. I know one of the uh, charitable endeavors you took part in here was the Neely House, the Neely Foundation. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the status of that? Is that still going strong these yeah, days? Yeah, it is. Um, um, we've been very fortunate with the support. Unfortunately, most people have been touched by cancer in one way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I just felt at the time when I was a player that I was going to uh, do something in memory of my parents, lost both parents to the disease. So uh, now we're looking at doing something um, – at the Friedman School over at Tufts Medical Center with more bringing in more nutrition and um, um, health and wellness because, uh, you know, when you go through cancer, you get all these treatments and you get these drugs into your body, and then your immune system gets shot down. So you try to, we're going to try and help bring up the immune system with this great doctor who's a, a great nutritionist and, and understands what patients need and what they're deficient in. So uh, we're looking forward to doing that. Yeah, and just for listeners who are unaware that he opened the Neely House uh, several years ago, like you said, after you, you lost both parents. And it's for when people are uh, having their family members treated for cancer, it's somewhere for them to stay so they don't have to oh. put up for a hotel and all that stuff. So Yeah, it's. I mean, we've had almost 6,000 families stay there wow. since 95. So Incredible. It's, it's certainly a need. You know, you don't realize these things, right, where there's families sometimes that will travel two hours each way to come for treatment. And, yeah, you know, then they got a park, or 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 maybe they they just live t- just too far away, and but they can't afford hotels. So we're you know we're we're doing what we can to help put put them up, so awesome. they don't have to worry about that. Just worry about getting healthy. That's an amazing cause. I mean, uh, thank you so much for coming in. All right, did you have more? For, all right, could uh, talk I, to I, you I for seventeen <laughs> hours, <laughs> but we appreciate. Hours. I, I, I let's got, do one more journal question to tap it all off. G- give us your best shot. Ah, uh, like, shoot! Fuck, come on, I already, man. I already shot all those wads in here. <laughs> I, I, oh, how about this? Do people do people close to you in your life like no? Stay away from him. Maybe after a tough loss right now, currently by the team. One hundred percent. Yeah, oh, I see you. In, <laughs> I see you in the pull elevator. up Cam's car and don't say yeah. a word to him. <laughs> no, no, it's it's. I get home and it's you know, I, I the deck is cleared. Um, I, I I've heard stories when I get in the elevator, people know they don't have to say much. <laughs> <laughs> did now? Did you drop a uh, kick his ass, see bass in the locker room? Did we hear that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> fill the fill the listeners in on that one. Um, well, I guess the the boys were talking one time about you know wouldn't it be great if Cam came in and did that? So I, um, yeah. So David David Backus came and asked me if I would do it, um, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Why not? So, but and the funny thing was, the my buddy who actually was the one that delivered that line was at the game, and if I would have known, if I would have known they wanted me to do that, I would have had to come in the locker room. Uh, you would have well. gotten a costume. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Cam. I mean, congrats on an incredible career and a, and, a, and a second career in hockey as president of the Bruins. So we appreciate you very much coming on. Yeah, my pleasure, and, and congrats to you guys. I thank know. you. Oh, I, saw, I read your article, by the way. That was a great article. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't mention your your son follows the show. Yes, he does. He doesn't play hockey, but he's Out going in Cali, to Cali, right? And he's very intelligent, I hear. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he, he got him from mom, I guess. So. <laughs> well, you got to shout him out, so yeah. he'll be like, "Oh, dad, shouted me out." All right, uh, my son Jack. He watches you guys all the time. Loves the show. So, uh, what Jack, up, Jack? This is, this is for you. Awesome. Well, he's pretty much the only reason you came on. So, thanks to you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Jack, we owe you one, buddy. Send him a merch package, now. <laughs>